Good afternoon. Um, my name is Armin Cohen. I'm executive director of the Clean Air Task Force uh, virtually in Boston. And uh, welcome to today's webinar on universities going nuclear. Uh, we have a lot of really inf interesting information on some, some new initiatives at the university level on nuclear to talk about today. I'm, I'm quite excited. Um, I'm going to let uh, Rich Powell from uh, ClearPath steer us through this, but I just wanted to make an opening comment for those of you who um, might find it unusual for an environmental group to be collaborating on a webinar like this uh, or on nuclear. We think there's enormous potential for nuclear energy to play a role in decarbonizing the global energy system, not just for electricity, but for zero carbon fuels. In fact, we think it's likely to be an essential element of a successful climate program. So it's, it's really exciting to see a lot of innovation in this space. And I think it's important to remember that it was universities where nuclear power was essentially invented and validated. Um, University of Chicago ran the first uh, controlled nuclear reaction in the early 40s, and there was research in front of that. So to some extent, this has been an academic enterprise from the beginning. Um, universities have been very involved in the evolution of nuclear energy. But I think what's most interesting about this moment is the emergence of a number of new technologies and applications for nuclear that weren't even thought of 20 years ago or might have been thought of but not pursued. So we think that uh, the kinds of things you're going to see today uh, by way of um, research and a demonstration at the university level could be really critical in making nuclear a more scalable uh, uh, option for, for climate mitigation. Um, so uh, with that, um, I, I welcome you and thank you for joining us today. I'm going to turn it over to Rich Powell, Executive Director of ClearPath, um, our co-sponsors of today to describe the run of the day and to do further introductions and framing. Over to you, Rich. Huge thanks, Armand, and big thanks to Clean Air Task Force for co-hosting this with us. Uh, CATF is just a terrific partner uh, across the range of innovative clean energy technologies, including nuclear energy. So really appreciate your partnership in arranging this really important discussion today. At ClearPath, we're really excited about the opportunity to talk about a unique aspect of the development of new nuclear energy. Uh, as I think our special guest is uh, going to discuss in a few minutes, there's a long history of Department of Energy support for universities and nuclear energy. Uh, universities are developing the next generation of talent. As Armin mentions, these projects can be exciting for the next generation of engineers, for our current nuclear workforce uh, is aging. In fact, many of the current advanced reactor companies were founded by this new generation, which have an interest in how nuclear can provide clean energy to address climate change. Outside of the workforce, the partnerships between advanced reactor developers and universities offer potential pathways to deploy new technology in novel ways. These facilities will also support these technologies with their research and development capabilities. Overall, these projects demonstrate that there's excitement for advanced reactors beyond the Department of Energy and private industry. These projects are an example of that. I look forward to hearing from our panelists and questions from the audience. I'm going to introduce our three presenters first. Um, those are going to be Dr. Rusty Towell of Abilene Christian University. Dr. Towell's research emphasis is on molten salt cooled advanced reactors. He's participated in many research projects at the Brookhaven, Fermi, and Los Angeles National Laboratories. And on the ACU campus, he's the director of the Nuclear Energy Experimental Testing Lab, or the NEXT Lab. Second, we'll hear from Dr. Wes Hines of the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Dr. Hines is the head of the Nuclear Engineering Department at the university and is the Distinguished Postel Professor and a Chancellor's Professor. He was recognized by the American Society for Engineering Education Nuclear Engineering Division through their Glenn Murphy Distinguished Nuclear Engineering Educator Award in 2014 and was selected as an American Nuclear Society Fellow in 2015. And last but certainly not least, we'll hear from Dr. Katie Huff of the University of Illinois. Dr. Huff is a Blue Waters Assistant Professor in the Department of Nuclear, Plasma, and Radiological Engineering at the University of Illinois, where she leads the Advanced Reactors and Fuel Cycles Research Group. Now, I think I'm going to turn things back over to Armin to quickly introduce our uh, special guest who's going to join us by, I think, a pre-recorded video with, with some remarks about, uh, about these programs first, and then we'll go back to our presenters. Well, thank you, Rich. I, I think uh, Dr. Rita Barenwall is well known um, to uh, people in this, uh, this audience um, 
as someone who has deep academic roots. Uh, presently, she is the Assistant Secretary for the Office of Nuclear Energy at the US Department of Energy and has been, I guess, the steward of a whole a renaissance of good policy uh, that's really emerged in the last few years towards nuclear innovation. Um, I think uh, historically DOE was not necessarily seen as the hub of advanced thinking, but I think uh, Rita has shaken things up quite a bit. So uh, although she couldn't join us today, uh, I hope you'll find her video remarks uh, a good frame for what follows. So I don't know who's- Hi, I'm Rita right. Barrenwall, Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Energy in the US Department of Energy. Thank you to Clean Air Task Force and ClearPath for hosting this webinar and for the opportunity to share some remarks with you. The Office of Nuclear Energy partners with U.S. universities in numerous ways to help execute its core research and development mission while also helping to maintain university nuclear energy research infrastructure and nurture development of the future nuclear workforce. Specifically, through our Nuclear Energy University Program, NEUP, any designates up to 20% of the funds appropriated to our R&D programs to be applied to university-led R&D and associated infrastructure projects to be, to be performed at universities and collaborating research institutions. These R&D projects are awarded through an annual open competitive solicitation process. Also, our Integrated University Program, or IUP, provides graduate level fellowships and undergraduate level scholarships to support nuclear science and engineering education, research, and training of the next generation nuclear energy workforce. Furthermore, our Research Reactor Infrastructure Program, or RRI, supports the continued operation of 25 U.S. university research reactors located at 24 universities by providing research reactor fuel services and maintenance of fuel fabrication equipment. NE considers these irreplaceable assets to be a national research treasure, and we are committed to supporting their continued operation. Annually, NE procures fresh plate fuel from BWXT for high-performance reactors at MER and MIT, and retrieves used fuel for interim storage in the National Laboratory Complex. I recently toured the BWXT fabrication facilities and came away very impressed by that capability. Our other primary RRI activity provides fuel services for the 12 University Training Research Isotope General Atomics Reactors, also known as Trigger Reactors. I'm especially proud of the department's innovative and dedicated efforts to maintain a viable Trigger fuel supply. Although no fresh Trigger fuel has been available for several years from the world's sole supplier, Trigger International in France, DOE has taken action multiple times in 2017 to recover lightly irradiated fuel from interim storage at Idaho National Lab and provide it to multiple university reactors for reuse. In parallel, NE and the National Nuclear Security Administration joined together in 2015 to provide nearly $16 million to help fund equipment and safety upgrades at the Trigger Fuel Fabrication Facility, ensuring that it will now be able to recommence operations in 2021. Because of this foresight, DOE is now able to authorize a contract with Trigger International that will allow the RRI program to procure nearly 700 Trigger elements over the next decade under very favorable terms, representing the identified lifetime fuel needed for all 12 university Trigger reactors. So, as I've described, any provides support to U.S. universities through many forms. This support enables universities to create partnerships, such as those between advanced reactor developers, as well as with each other. These relationships, both that are going to be featured in this webinar, offer potential pathways to deploy new technology in rapid and novel ways. Finally, advanced reactor research and development activities reach beyond the DOE and private sector, and the three projects being highlighted here today are great examples of that. We're at a very crucial, exciting juncture for advanced reactor development and deployment. And to quote some great lyrics, this is not a moment, it's a movement. So I'm very, very thrilled that you all are part of that. Enjoy today's webinar. Terrific. 
Uh, well, with those inspiring opening remarks from Dr. Baronwall, I, first I should just say I'm, ter I'm, I'm delighted to see the Warring University logos now at play between uh, Dr. Baronwall and some of our other presenters here. Um, clearly a little bit of pride going on there. So I think we're gonna start with uh, Dr. Towell from uh, ACU. Uh, and just as a quick reminder to folks, as questions occur to you, please put them into the Q&A feature. We're gonna be using that to tee up questions for discussion after the presentations. Feel free to chat away in the chat feature as well. And after this, we'll be emailing out both a recording of the video and the chat feature to the extent you've got other ideas or projects you wanna share, reports that you wanna direct folks to. But again, if you wanna get something onto the Q&A agenda for the end of the conversation, please use the Q&A feature. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Towell. Dr. Tell, you, you, are, you are on mute. Yes. I'm sure it was brilliant. <laughs> Great. Thank you. I hope that's uh, the last mistake I make all day, but we'll, we'll see. You can hear me now? Okay. Let me start over again. Thank you for allowing me to be here. I'm, I'm honored to, to talk to you about what we're trying to do at Abilene Christian University. I will spend just a minute telling you a little bit about ACU because unlike uh, UT and Illinois, I assume that uh, ACU might be a little bit less familiar. So it might be wondering why we're part of this. So uh, allow me a few minutes to tell you a few things about uh, ACU. Um, Abilene Christian University is, is located in Abilene, Texas. We uh, are in a great city in West Texas, about 150 miles to the west of Fort Worth area, pretty much in the center mass of the state. Um, our, our ACU uh, campus is split between our, our home campus in Abilene and our uh, Center for Graduate and Remote uh, Learning in Dallas. Uh, we are excited that this is the third year in a row where we've had increased uh, enrollment. And so despite the pandemic and the downturn, a lot of things, we've actually grown our enrollment. Um, one thing that we're very proud of amongst the many accolades we've received uh, from those that evaluate uh, universities is the focus we put on student learning and particularly our undergraduate population. Uh, ACU is the only Texas university nationally ranked in four student success areas. And the one that's really relevant to us today is their involvement in undergraduate research. And so the, the project I'm talking to you about today, of course, uses a lot of student involvement. Uh, ACU is very, has a, a long commitment to, to research despite being a, a, a private liberal arts university. Uh, the physics program started over 50 years ago and it was really focused from the very beginning on, on research. Uh, engineering has been uh, something we've added just lately. In 2012, we started our engineering program. Our first graduates allowed us to apply for ABET accreditation and we were very proud that our program has grown to 19 faculty and 174 undergraduate students. The university has invested 50 plus million dollars over the last decade in new science and engineering infrastructure. We've hired a vice president of research really to strengthen our research and our engagement with uh, industry. And we have plans for a, a new $15 million science and engineering research facility that's, that we hope to break ground on next year. We have a long history of research in the, in the chemistry department, over 60 years of funded research from a lot of different foundations. In the physics department, we have over 40 years of continuous funding from the Department of Energy focused on nuclear research. A lot of different national labs, a lot of different programs. Our, our old model was to take our students to, to really world-class facilities and allow them to have exposure at, at Fermilab or Brookhaven or Los Alamos or other national labs. Our, our new model is to build some of those world-class facilities on the ACU campus and really welcome the world here. ACU's mission is to educate students for Christian service and leadership throughout the world. What does this look like if you're an engineering student or someone in the STEM field? Well, that's where our next lab comes in. Our nuclear energy experimental testing lab is looking for uh, global solutions to the world's critical needs. And so, especially relevant to our discussion today, what can we do with nuclear energy? Well, the world needs a solution to energy. About half the world's population lives in what I'd call energy poverty uh, and clean a safe, available electricity would solve this form and raise people out of poverty and improve their standard of living. Another need for the world is a, a treatment for cancer. Half the people in the world will be uh, affected by cancer during their lifetime. There's a great therapy called target of alpha therapy, but the world needs a source of medical radioisotopes. And, and finally, the need for pure water is something that the, the world needs. And so each of these um, energy to end uh, sort of poverty and raise the standard of living 
uh, medical isotopes to treat and diagnose cancer and water for sanitation drinking. These are things that affect billions of people each around the globe. And the wonderful thing is that uh, advanced reactors can really address all three of these issues. So uh, molten salt reactors are safe, clean, efficient. They're multifunctional. They'll address all three of these needs, scalable from very small to large, and of course, they're carbon free. And so that's what we really are, are thinking about here on the ASU campus, part of the next lab. Our mission is to find solutions for energy that's less expensive and safer, for water that's pure and abundant, and medical isotopes to, to treat cancer, uh, while educating the next generation of leaders in science and engineering. Uh, what's pictured here is a picture of our, our molten salt test loop with one of our, our students uh, in it. They, with this background, we reached the position where we realized that ACU really needs to, to build its own research reactor. And so that's the what I wanna talk about for the rest of, of my time with you is, the molten salt research reactor at ACU. Um, it's something we're actively working on. Our team at ACU has over 60 people from students, faculty, and staff. Uh, in the summer, we uh, took a break from wearing our mask and social distancing to get this group picture. Um, we have a lot of different projects happening on campus that are spread across uh, three different facilities and multiple departments. I won't go through all these for the sake of time, but our molten salt test loop has been operating and flowing salt for over two years and we're actively designing their next systems that will operate at both higher temperatures and larger volumes of salt. Our chemistry group is actively working on how do we remove fission fragments from the salt? How do we purify the salt? And how do we know what the salt content is? Um, other groups are working on instrumentation, designing our research reactor, uh, working with a, a NEUP funded molten salt filter grant and, and other, uh, other projects. We're not trying to do this alone. We formed a research alliance. So we have our next research alliance or Nextra. We've added uh, collaborators from Georgia Tech, Texas A&M and the University of Texas. All three of these universities have experience with research reactors and bring key uh, programs and personnel to support us. I, I won't name everyone, but just to give you a flavor, I'll, I'll give some introductions. The, the uh, molten salt research reactor we're planning on building is, is going to be just exactly that. It's going to be a university research reactor as defined in 104C. It's gonna have a maximum uh, power level of one megawatt thermal. We do plan on going through a two-step licensing process, the so-called part 50, where we'll apply for a construction permit and then separately an operating license. We had our first meeting with NRC last month, our first public meeting with NRC last month, and we've submitted our regulatory engagement plan and have a docket number. So all of our uh, meetings and, and minutes, et cetera, um, are all searchable uh, in the Adams database at NRC. We plan on building this reactor on or near the ACU campus, but the exact location is of course part of the licensing process. We are gonna build our molten salt research reactor as pretty much a simplified molten salt reactor experiment. So this experiment that, that operated at uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory in the 1960s from 1965 to 69, it's, we we're patterning our work very much after that. So the three big differences are we're making some changes so that our reactor is easier to license and has a smaller, um, uh, radiological signature. So we're working with low enriched uranium instead of the high enriched uranium. We're looking at lower power, almost to order of magnitude lower than the design for the MSRE, and that allows us to have lower power density. And then also inside of containment, we're not going to use water as cooling, and so that removes one of the biggest hazards from the MSRE. The molten salt reactor, uh, research reactor is pictured in the top um, here. Um, the conceptual and a conceptual design, the containment is in the center. Uh, the right is a secondary uh, molten salt loop that allows us to remove uh, thermal energy produced in the reactor and vent it to the atmosphere. And on the left is the fuel storage, and it looks very much like the MSRE from uh, the 1960s below it. Uh, a few more details about our reactor and our design is uh, we're, like the MSRE, we're going to be uh, graphite moderated fluoride salt. We are going to suspend uh, the fuel in the salt. Uh, as uh, Dr. Barnwall mentioned in the introduction, we are um, planning on partnering with the RRI program to get our fuel from the Department of Energy, and they've sent us a letter of support uh, so agreeing to support a non-standard fuel type for our reactor. The uh, maximum thermal output, as I said, will be one megawatt thermal. That means that we can build a, the primary reactor vessel about four and a half feet in diameter and about six feet high. Uh, a few more details about this. Um, it'll be very much like the MSRE. One difference is instead of using a frozen salt plug at the bottom of the primary loop, the primary loop is just a, a loop that goes from the reactor core up through a pump, through a heat exchanger, and back to it. 
There's a drain tank at the bottom and we'll keep the salt in the primary loop by overpressurizing that drain tank and forcing the salt to stay in the primary loop. So we, we don't have to depend upon a, a freeze plug to, to keep us operating safely. Um, obviously fuel storage uh, on the left. Um, uh, real briefly about the schedule, I won't go into all the details here, but it, our goal is to go critical um, in five years. So if you look at the third line down, the reactor build all the way to the right, first critical in 2025. That's the driver for our project is to have a, a reactor that, that we can design, license, build, and go critical in sort of a five-year period. And so that does drive us to follow a lot of the MSRE designs, uh, repeating a lot of, of that experiment. It's a proven technology that was done 50 years ago, and we just want to show that the NRC can license it and we can uh, build it again today. Uh, that's our goal to, to go critical to achieve that. A lot of work has to happen in parallel, and we're confident that, uh, that we can do that with the team we've assembled, uh, both here at ACU and as well as our, our collaborators at Nextra. I'd like to thank those that have supported our work, uh, Department of Energy, the Excelsior Foundation, Development Corporation of Abilene, and our current sponsor of Natura Resources. Um, website for more information about our lab is acunextlab.org. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to taking your questions when the time's right. Thank you. Outstanding, really exciting update on your project. Um, next, we're gonna move on to Dr. Hines. I will unmute first. <laughs> Loud and clear. I will learn from others. <clears throat> yeah, I'm Wes Hines. I've been at the university for 25 years. Uh, I don't have a slide about our, our department. We have the largest PhD program in the country. We're 30 miles from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, we have over 100 nuclear related companies within 50 miles of my office. So we're kind of in the nuclear hotbed of the United States and uh, love it. There are lots of great people to work with. Wes, you have now gone on to mute. Yeah. Okay. No luck moving my slides. Oh, well, now I'm having too much luck moving my slides. <laughs> Maybe someone's moving it for me. See page up. See, my page up doesn't work. My up arrow is not working. Maybe there's just a huge time lag. Wow. Okay, so what we're doing at the university is we're, we're designing, constructing, licensing, and operating a facility that's gonna be used to measure nuclear properties. Specific, uh, specifically cross sections for uh, materials in the fast flux domain. Uh, so we call this the fast neutron source. Uh, it's a very flexible, reconfigurable design that can be used to mimic the spectrum of a sodium reactor, of a lead reactor, of a molten salt reactor. And again, the goal is to have improved cross sections for neutronic codes for modeling and simulation. The facility is gonna be located in a specially designed and heavily shielded vault that's in our new nuclear engineering building. Uh, we actually move into our building next summer. We're really excited and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, but first, let me tell you a little bit about the need. So if we look in the upper right corner here, we see what the spectrum looks like for a sodium reactor, kind of this, this, uh, this mountain on the right, and for a, a thermal reactor. And if we look down below it, this is just the, the scattering cross section of U-235 and this is the actual cross section in blue. In red is the uncertainty of those cross sections. And you can see down in the thermal domain, you know, the uncertainties are, are maybe 5%. But if we look up in the fast domain, uh, we're anywhere from 30 to, to maybe even up to 70%. So we have these huge uncertainties in the cross sections of these important uh, nuclear uh, data. Uh, and why is that important? Because nuclear data goes into our modern sim, and the modern sim is what we use to design our next generation reactors. So if we want to do a better job of, of designing them, 
then we need to have better data. This high uncertainty in this data makes the designs more conservative. And if you have to add in conservatism to your designs, it makes them more expensive and then less economically competitive. Um, here are seven fast reactor developers. Uh, so we can see it's not just one design that we're, we're trying to assist. It's all of these different designs in, in the fast domain. Uh, and here's kind of a case study. This was uh, a paper that was published by some researchers at TerraPower dealing with their traveling wave reactor. And if you look in the red here, it says the uncertainties of many parameters are higher than is desired, motivating additional efforts in cross-section measurements. And these uncertainties contribute to a lot of key uh, design parameters, such as the, the beginning of life K effective, you know, plus or minus 2.2% because of these uncertainties. You know, some of these void, void worths and uh, coolant temperature feedback coefficients, plus or minus 138%. So that's really huge. And I know that they're, they're very interested in having uh, better cross sections or cross sections with, with less uncertainty so they can do a better job with their modeling and simulation. Uh, so now I'll jump into the home of this new facility, this fast neutron source. This is uh, the new building. Uh, really the, the left half of that building is gonna be our freshman program, our engineering freshman program. And the right half of that new building is, is really our nuclear engineering portion of the building and kind of in this lower right portion, there's a high bay that goes into, this is built on kind of a hill. So it, it, this, the bottom part of the building juts into the hill where our, our shielded spaces are. It's a 228,000 net assignable square feet facility, $120 million, $129 million budget. And right now uh, we're on schedule even with COVID and, and just a little bit under budget. So we're excited. This is a picture of the building from I think three or four days ago. So you can see we're to the spot where we're, we're putting in the windows, we're putting up the brick uh, and they're finishing the interior. <clears throat> this is the, the vault that's being built in the basement. Actually, it's already been built. Uh, the, the cap to this, to this vault, in fact, this is where they were pouring the cap. The cap is uh, about 90 feet long, five and a half foot thick concrete, about 24 feet wide. So it's this, it was this huge pour. It was interesting when they poured that, they cooled the, the aggregate with liquid nitrogen because they were afraid that, uh, that, it, you know, that you can't have the internal of the concrete too much higher of a temperature than the external of the concrete. And then they shut down the road next to it because they thought, well, if we had this, this big cloud that came up, then it would, uh, it would cause problems in, in the road. But uh, we have a, a 9 MeV Linux that's going into this linear accelerator vault. This is the fast neutron source vault. It's uh, about 70 feet long, 16 feet wide, about 20 feet tall. It has a five ton crane so that we can move the shielding and the core pieces. The design of the fast neutron source itself, it, it sits over here. It's a core, it's not a reactor. I'm really careful not to call it a reactor because we don't want to have to license it with 10 CFR 60 or 50. We license it with 10 CFR 70, which is just the ability to have the special nuclear material. Uh, it's a neutron generator driven subcritical system, 0.95 to 0.98 K effective. It has an oscillator. So there's an oscillator that moves material in and out of the core. And that's what's used to calculate cross sections, uh, integral cross sections. We also have a, a long vault. So in the future, we can have a beam line for some differential cross section. Uh, we have a, a pneumatic transfer system, which will take uh, materials and move them into the core and then through the, the cap. And up above it is a, is a nuclear instrumentation counting uh, laboratory. Uh, and it's highly flexible and reconfigurable. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, we got the concept from the Mazurka facility, which is over in France at Cotterash. Uh, the facility that they have there, it has all these hanging tubes. These hanging tubes they call wrapper tubes, and they fill it up with different types of materials, rodlets and platelets. So they can put whatever materials they want to put into that core and build a core of any design that they want. So we looked at the same type of flexible design that we can reconfigure. And we're using a very, a very simple design 
where we have these five by five stacks of what we call cassettes. So each one of these cassettes holds materials. The materials may be uh, moderator, it may be uh, simulated coolant. Originally, we looked at, at having the whole core as being a fast core, and it took about 4,500 pounds of 20% or 19.75% of rich uranium. When we had our first trip to NRC, we quickly learned that, that that's a CAT2 facility. We would have to have 24-hour guards. It just wasn't practical to put on a, on a, on a at least on our university's campus. So we moved to 9.75% uranium, which gets us to CAT3. And we moved to an integrated or a coupled design where we have a, a thermal section coupled with a fast section. So that was kind of, you know, these old, us old gray haired men, you know, how are we going to design this, this core? And uh, we moved on to what we call a plated design. So now in these cassettes, rather than putting rods and, and, uh, and the simulated coolant, each one of these cassettes, we can load with whatever materials we want. We can load, you know, uranium, lead, cadmium, salt, and, uh, and we use artificial intelligence to tell us which materials to load in which positions of all those cassettes. So we have a couple thousand cassette positions and we can tell the computer that we want a certain spectrum. In this case, in this lower right, this is a, a sodium fast spectrum. And we can ask it to optimize the core configuration so that we, met, so that we have an optimum representation of that spectrum. And that's called representativity. And we get a representativity of about 0.99. So it's basically like a correlation coefficient of 0.99, which is very strong. Here, the, the orange is the fast sodium reactor. And, and we actually can, our, uh, our techniques gives us a choice of which loading we want to have, whether we want to have a loading with a little bit less representativity and a higher flux level, or a very good representativity without quite as much of a flux level. But when we let the computer do this, it reduced the, the amount of uranium that we needed by a factor of three and improved our performance, which is really this uh, representativity by a factor of three. Uh, so I said that, you know, we were looking at using 9.75% enriched uranium. Uh, some of the reviewers, when we have, have uh, uh, put in proposals with this idea, said, you know, there's this long timeline to get that uranium. It's a high risk. Uh, you know, that's really been the only negatives that we've had with the proposal is just that, you know, it's going to take you a while to build this thing. So we're actually looking at, at a stepwise design where we start off with using, just using natural uranium and we can still have the flux match, matching, the, the spectral matching, but we won't have quite as high of a, of a flux level. In fact, it's, a, it's reduced by about an order of magnitude. So that means our experiments will have to increase in time by an order of magnitude. Uh, but by reducing it from this enriched uranium to natural uranium, which we already have, uh, we don't have to worry about the Part 70 license. We don't have to worry about, uh, at least to such a degree, that the safeguards and material accountability requirements, because we don't have special nuclear material. We don't have to have safety and shutdown systems, criticality safety plans. Uh, we don't have to have the additional security requirements. So it really reduces the risk and, uh, and allows us to do a proof of principle very easily. And it's a, a, fair, a fairly straightforward upgrade from the natural uranium to the enriched uranium in the future. So in summary, we've designed this fast neutron source to meet nat our national need. Uh, when we first started designing this building, we had lots of concepts. We knew we had the opportunity to do something big, something that nuclear engineering departments, you know, might happen once in every 50 years. And, uh, and we talked to NASA, we talked to other, other uh, nuclear potential uh, partners. And, and we, we finally settled at, at this idea of this fast neutron source. Um, it's gonna allow us to reduce the, the, un, reduce the uncertainty of cross sections and do a better job with designing our fast reactors. Uh, in the future, we also have talked to Y12 and, and, BW, or, and uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory. They'd like to use it as a nuclear criticality safety uh, uh, 
site. You don't want to send everybody to Sandia all the time. And just the use of this AI-based design optimization allows us to say, okay, we want to have molten salt today. We want to have a lead reactor tomorrow, and it'll tell us how to reconfigure the core. So thank you again for this opportunity. Thanks very much, Dr. Hines. Uh, really exciting presentation and project. Uh, we, we work quite a bit on uh, the, the federal effort to develop the versatile test reactor uh, for, mm -hmm. for DOE. And so, you know, absolutely recognize the need to get more capabilities like this at, at multiple scales uh, into our nuclear innovation system here in the US. So um, really, really exciting project. Um, last, uh, uh, we're gonna turn to uh, Dr. Huff. Thanks very much. So yeah, I'm Katie Huff at the University of Illinois. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about a project that we've proposed, the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program. Um, we may be able to build a test reactor on our campus in the risk reduction um, budget scope for uh, our advanced reactor uh, demonstration proposal. So what I'll be discussing here is like why and why Illinois and what we're planning to do and things like that. Okay, so the state of Illinois has historically led the world in nuclear energy innovation with the first nuclear chain reaction, the first commercial nuclear power plant, the leadership of Argonne, where lots of advanced nuclear reactors were designed. Um, the University of Illinois also operated a research reactor on its campus for 38 years before it was decommissioned. That device was the second of its kind in the nation, and it was commemorated as an ANS National Historic Landmark. Such research and training and test reactors throughout the US as well as the world have been really pivotal to cutting edge advancements in nuclear technologies and discoveries and reactor design. But while student enrollment and enthusiasm in this kind of carbon-free nuclear energy is growing, the number of research reactors at those campuses has been steadily declining. And the most recent um, research reactor built was nearly 30 years ago on a university campus. Um, it is particularly troubling to me that the state of Illinois is home to more commercial reactors than any other state, but now has zero university research reactors to train the workforce that is needed to operate them. And I see this graph, which has the degrees granted in these colors, as well as the blue line, the operating university research reactors overlaying as a function of time. I see in this graph a massive hands-on training gap that is developing on campuses around the country. So I think all three of these institutions are right where we need to be developing some real hands-on training technology. Um, and so, you know, what does this have to do with advanced reactor deployment? Well, the nuclear engineering faculty at the University of Illinois, um, along with our vendor partner, Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation, believe that a new university research training and test reactor that represents the next generation of nuclear technology could uniquely underpin advanced reactor deployment in a lot of ways. One of the needs that in addition to the workforce that will be required for that advanced reactor deployment in the future, another need is reactor testing. So, you know, this has to do with uh, the NRC's guidance for advanced reactor licensing. That guidance clearly indicates that prototype tests will assist in the evaluation of any commercial license for an advanced reactor. But prototypes for those advanced reactor designs don't always exist. A university, however, and it, the research and testing license available to universities would be very appropriate to conduct prototype tests in support of those commercial NRC licenses. So, um, you know, universities are a really excellent environment to conduct single and multiple effect tests as well as startup and operations testing for these next generation reactors. But uh, next generation reactors should be built on a university campus to allow those prototype tests and to advance and accelerate the commercial licenses that we see sort of coming down the pipe for NRC. Um, there's also a need for next generation research and development for like auxiliary systems, things that aren't related necessarily to a single ordinary commercial deployment. Lots of advanced reactors have really open questions in instrumentation and control, human machine interfaces, microgrid technology, hybrid energy systems, 
hydrogen economies and whether or not nuclear can play a role. And all of that next generation research and development is really the kind of thing that can only happen at like national laboratories and universities. And when we talk about universities, we also can sort of see that there's a lot of independent thought and advancement and innovation that could contribute to our advanced deployments uh, across the world. There's another need that's not satisfied by deployments of advanced reactors behind the fence at a lab or in a remote location. It's public engagement. So with Professor Andrew Chapman of Kyushu University, um, our team at Illinois conducted a survey to better understand public opinions regarding nuclear. There are a ton of conclusions from this, but I'll share one, which is that higher education correlates really well with support of nuclear power. The more people know, the more familiar they are, the more they are likely to support it. And at the University of Illinois, we have a lot of outreach. And if we had, for example, an advanced test reactor, the public would learn a lot. Hundreds of thousands of people visit universities every year, like the University of Illinois. There's 50,000 students just on campus in general. So you reach a lot more people uh, if you have a device like this that's, that's open to the public. Uh, and there's also a need to demonstrate commercializable products. In great news, universities consume a lot of products. Uh, we have supercomputers, which consume extraordinary electricity. We have microgrids, which incorporate lots of renewable technology that our students have been insisting on. We often operate our own bus fleets, right? And at the University of Illinois, we actually have all of these things, plus a very high uh, capacity steam system to warm up all of these older buildings that um, in the winter get quite cold unless you turn on the radiators. So the integrated steam system is a district heating um, application that university campuses across the US actually have a lot of these combined heat and power systems. And a test reactor could demonstrate linkage to all of these different areas, these kind of unique commercializable products. And that in itself is an area of research. Um, and demonstrating that market is going to be absolutely necessary to the second, third, fourth, fifth, and nth of a kind reactor deployments that we hope to see for these advanced reactors. And universities in particular kind of represent some of the things that a lot of very small micro reactors, for example, among this advanced reactor set of technologies are going to be sort of targeting. Universities care about emissions reduction and they're willing to put their money there. They have a lot of thermal power needs district heating I've already mentioned, they have a very small scale generation sort of appropriate for micro and small modular reactors. And they have a lot of very delicate infrastructure that needs to continue to be powered whether or not the power, the sun is shining, high performance computing, um, very delicate experiments, etc. And so, you know, universities are a great place to demonstrate these markets. Um, the University of Illinois in particular is very interested in this. We'd like to lead the world in decarbonization. Our university students would like to decarbonize our existing grid. Um, we'd like to be carbon neutral by 2050, but the campus master plan has incorporated solar, biofuel, geothermal, wind, and has suggested that if small nuclear were available, we could replace our fossil generation on campus to help work towards our uh, goal. There are lots and lots of campuses, just like the University of Illinois, that have students who protest the fossil fuel use on their campuses to warm the buildings. So we have these values. We own and operate our own embedded grid with 55 megawatts of electric demand and, 55 mega and 50 megawatts thermal steam need on average. And that capacity is also combined with lots of renewables on campus, a lot of natural gas. and. Um, we have a, a large coal and, and uh, natural gas facility. Um, we'd love to um, supplement that fossil use on our campus while also training and doing research associated with advanced reactors. So, you know, by placing an advanced test reactor right next to our existing power production facility, we could train students, reach the general public, train operators, conduct research in advanced instrumentation and controls and hydrogen economies and the development of high temperature uh, you know, ca catalysts. Really exciting stuff could be done. And it, the, our dream is to deploy this to a device right next to our uh, power production so that we can also hook it up directly into our co-generated steam system. Um, here's an overview of that location, but I, I won't go into it. 
Okay, so what have we suggested? We submitted a proposal to ARDP. We have lots of consortium partners and we're working with the USNC vendor for our reactor design. This is a small 15 megawatt thermal high temperature gas reactor. It is deployed below grade. You can see in sweet picture here, there's some beautiful videos on their website. Um, and we hope to have a whole clean energy training and research center built around this device. Um, there are lots of amazing features that drove us at the University of Illinois to select this vendor. Um, one, of course, is their very cool looking fuel. It's a fully encapsulated, fully ceramic micro encapsulated fuel with trisoparticles. The exceptional safety is going to drive a lot of our ability to manipulate this device. But there are a lot of other great features, which in the interest of time, I may have to skip, but I strongly encourage you to go to the USNC website and watch some of the really cool videos that they have about what their vision is, how the reactor works, what they've done so far to sort of evaluate it, um, because they're really ahead of the game. And uh, they have a licensing process at the, at the Canadian regulator. So there's a lot of information out there already. We're proposing one device at the University of Illinois and potentially one at another partner location, at, for example, Idaho. Uh, this will demonstrate not only that you can build a microreactor of this high temperature gas type, but also that there is something helpful in the modularity and that the factory built approach to microreactors has legs. So that's what we proposed. Um, these are the folks kind of in, in charge of it on the UI, UIUC side. Of course, our con consortium partners and the partnership is really large, but the faculty at the University of Illinois involved deeply in this proposal are, is not just me. It includes Professor Brooks, Kozlowski, Stubbins, and Newton as well. I'd love to talk more about the technology, but you'll just have to go to the USNC website for that. Outstanding. Thank you, Dr. Hupp. Best of luck to you and the consortium on the uh, ARDP application. Uh, for folks that aren't following this program, the first generation of those uh, awards was just released uh, two weeks ago now. And so the next generation, these risk reduction uh, awards should be announced. Well, uh, we don't have Dr. Barnwell on here to promise us exactly the date, but you know, hopefully, hopefully any week now we'll be hearing uh, we'll be hearing more about those. So uh, we're now going to turn to uh, Q and A from the audience. A couple have already come in through the Q and A feature. If folks have more, please put them into that feature. And so we're going to start to to turn to what we've gotten in so far. Um, Rusty, I think the first one for you. A quick technical question from the audience. They wanted to clarify that the fuel uh, in your design is dissolved in the primary salt loop and, and you don't use a solid fuel like like triso or, or metal fuel. We're, we're going right into the weeds with the technical question. So that's that's um, correct. The research reactor would use uh, liquid fuel and dissolved in the salt. Great. Um, just confirm here. All right, and uh, can you answer this one? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That, that that'd be great. So the question is, how how do I how do we plan at U of I to do I and C and student research if the reactor is underground? Good question. And what isn't it supposed to stay at constant power? Well, this is a great question. So the reactor technology is amazing. Another extraordinary piece of the USNC device that drove us towards this vendor selection was that they have proposed a molten salt storage tank, just a clean salt for just energy storage that can actually allow you to decouple all of the safety and power features of the reactor from the output. And so it can really smooth um, some of the if we wanted to do a startup test, we could do a startup test and the, the energy would be smoothed out a bit by our storage capacity that's adjacent to the device. With I and C, of course, any reactor, whether it's underground or not, the control room has to exist. And in this particular device, we would have a whole training center built around it. And actually, there's a nice access staircase right next to the, the design that you can kind of see in some of the images on the website. But the, there is access to the sort of outer part of the core if you needed it. But ultimately, like it's a sealed core and it's down below the ground. But the same kind of instrumentation and control systems could be uh, would be up up above in the training center, just like right there next to it. Terrific. Rusty, I think next one for you. Um, is ACU collaborating with other Texas universities like AM? 
Yes. So we're 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 collaborating on this project with uh, University of Texas, Texas A and M, Georgia Tech. We're all collaborating on those. Great. And then I think for both Wes and Rusty, um, can you talk a little bit about how your universities have been collaborating with private industry to ensure that you're uh, both the, the, the next molten salt reactor and, and the fast neutron source uh, testing capabilities support a number of these developers, whether or not they're you know current ARDP recipients or, or folks that are a little bit further along? Or less, yeah. sorry, less far along is what I meant to say. Yeah, so we've reached out to, you know, the seven reactor developers that I had on my slide and, uh, and have, you know, letters of support from several of them. We've also reached out to you know, Idaho National Laboratory, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, uh, the French CAE, uh, and, and have, have built some international relationships. You know, there's, there's no place in the United States where you can get this, this spectrum of a fast reactor. And if uh, most of the experiments end up going on in, in Russia or in Belgium. So we really wanna bring this, this technology back to the United States. Great. Rusty, th thoughts about private sector collaboration? Sure, we, um, we are excited about what we're doing and how it will support the private sector because um, you know, as been mentioned, uh, the advanced reactor hasn't been licensed through the NRC. There hasn't been a new research reactor, even at a university brought online for over 30 years. And so the opportunity to, to build a research reactor that goes through the NRC licensing process is something that's supported by a wide range of industry uh, personnel because uh, if, if we can't if we can't get this reactor licensed in RC, then their plans of large commercial reactors have no chance. And so if we can sort of be a trailblazer there, then, then this is something that's gotten a lot of support and a lot of interest from uh, industry partners. And we've, we've uh, while we're not tied to a specific uh, partner, you know, company design, we are committed to licensing an advanced reactor and that, that they all find useful. Yeah. Um, probably, folks least favorite question to discuss, but we've got some questions from the audience about how you fund these things. Um, so probably for a combination of Katie and Rusty and, and Wes, if you'd like to weigh in as well, because obviously you're, you're doing a massive capital project yourself. Um, what, what's the ideal funding model for a new university research reactor? Uh, Public-private partnership, investor, you know, potential end user, led university state funding. Um, can you talk a little bit about your respective models uh, and also to the extent you know how this compares to the historical models for funding that first generation of, uh, of uh, trigger reactors. Um, I'll share that historically, a lot of the really early general atomics triggers were provided under grants from the Department of Energy or, you know, the Atomic Energy Commission at the time. And like they were more or less fully funded to support the like learning and education of the workforce and the scientific, you know, minds of the next generation. That is clearly like a bit of a challenge for DOE. Rita, you heard, you know, they already sort of fund the fuel and whatnot, but and they have the nuclear energy university program, you know, but our best option right now is this risk reduction um, advanced reactor demonstration proposal because there's no other real way to get something this size. You know, if you look at similar types of devices on university campuses, like a big supercomputer, right? NSF plus the university cost share might fund a big supercomputer, you know, recognizing that this has a lot of use. I think that a public private partnership is fine. I think investor led is fine. I think the increased reliance on university funds to do the kinds of things that government initiatives used to do is problematic for the likelihood that any of them are deployed. So I think more government attention needs to be paid to this need. Uh, really, I, I mean, I'm clearly biased, but I think, you know, the governments at the state level and the federal and the federal level really underestimate the resources currently available at universities. And if we want to educate the next generation workforce, we're going to need their support. I don't know, Rusty probably has similar feelings. I, I agree with everything you said. And I really I would point back to a graph you showed that talked about the number of graduates and the number of research reactors available and how you really have that experience gap there. And so obviously, if we want to develop the, the industry, then we, we need to get more of these facilities available. Um, at, at ACU, we're really blessed to have Natura Resources help partner with us to help uh, to provide some funding for, for this reactor. Um, and, and, and again, this is 
you know, where do you get funds from? I don't think there's a, um, a, a wrong answer. Um, obviously, if, if uh, the government's able to fund it through grants, that's, that's wonderful. Um, you know, we're hoping that they will be supportive um, and they, we are counting on their support through the RI program and, and other things, uh, gain vouchers we've already seen, received, things like that. So certainly the public funds are important, but I think the private funds are also important. Um, and and it, I guess the last thing I'd say there is, you know, one of the reasons why we're envisioning a, a small research reactor is a good first step because it, it is less expensive. And so it's something that I think that we can, can raise and, and do. Yeah, great. Um, Wes, I'm going to turn you with a, with a different one, which is, you know, I mentioned before, there's also this plan at DOE to build a versatile test reactor, probably at the Idaho National Lab, larger scale. Um, how are these two things, you know, assuming both projects are completed, how are these two, not a foregone conclusion, there's a bunch of years of appropriations, yeah. um, but, you know, between us and that, but assuming they're both completed, how are these things going to complement each other, work together, what, what are the different capabilities maybe they'll have, how, sh how should we think about the, uh, them as a, as a portfolio? Yeah, so, so you know, they're very different. Uh, our our uh, core our experimental facility won't have a high flux level like the versatile test reactor will have. So the versatile test reactor uh, will be used for material degradation damage. You know, our, our core will not be useful for that. Our, our core really has, has a couple purposes. The, the main purpose is to reduce the uncertainty of the cross section so we can do a better job of mod and sim and which might even help with some of the mod and sim of, of the versatile test reactor. Uh, if it, it could actually provide some input in, into their, uh, their design capabilities. Uh, you know, secondarily, you know, there, there's always the training. It's interesting because, you know, our, our students in the United States really, really only have light water reactors to train on, right? So having, you know, molten salt reactors or some of these other advanced reactors or, or allowing them to learn more about instrumentation, uh, for fast reactors, I think that's, that's, that's a huge need as we move forward. We have a lot of designers that are going into these advanced reactor spaces and, and the universities are really, you know, kind of hand tied to, to provide any type of, of training to our students. So we need, we need to build that intellectual capital. Great. Um, we got time for maybe just one or two more here. Um, let's talk about fuel. Wes, you, you shared a lot about your plans on, um, you know, use of, uh, of natural uranium, at least in, in the beginning, um, both at the later stage when you would need um, higher enriched uranium and, and for Katie and Rusty, your projects. Uh, what's the plan for fueling these facilities? Unfortunately, we don't have um, Secretary Barronwall here to, you know, commit to um, sending y'all um, nice supplies of HALU, but uh, uh, it, what's the plan? Where, where are you sourcing? Um, and um, also any thought to how that's going to uh, overlay with the, the commercial reactors that, that DOE is, is thinking about um, funding? At Katie, I realize yours is a bit of a hybrid and that it's in, in some sense also a semi-commercial reactor if, it, you know, if it's selling into, into the university. But uh, we'd just love to hear how everybody's thinking about sourcing, particularly the HALU, um, when, when you're ready. There's a reserved uh, quantity of high enriched uranium whose purpose is so it physically sits at Y12 and its purpose is legislated. It's outside of actually Dr. Barnwall's, um, which she talked about earlier actually about the provision of, of fabricated trigger fuel. A lot of that was not about the raw material itself, but rather the the fabricated fuel and the fabrication of that trigger from existing material. There is existing material earmarked for research reactors. Um, that's really only supposed to be used for that purpose. Uh, we fully intend to have downblended HU turned into HALU like it is for every other research reactor. Uh, this requires a proposal with the research reactor infrastructure program and cooperation from, from that program, which has existed for a long time. But the HU exists, it has to be downloaded as HALU. Ultimately, the fabrication can be done in the commercial in the same commercial pathway. So like Triso X or um, uh, BWXT are both available for generating Triso fuel and our, our vendor partner has a strategy for their fully ceramic micro encapsulated fuel. So that would be our, our main approach if for some reason the RI program is not able to do the thing that it always does for research reactors, which is to say provide that HALU. Um, we would be willing to look into purchasing it directly. 
from like an inventor. Yeah, we're a little bit different because uh, we're not a reactor, you know, so there's pros and cons without, you know, with not being a reactor. The, and, and when we talk to NRC, the reason we're not a reactor is because we don't go critical and we don't produce enough heat where you need decay heat removal. So that's where we're just called a core and we're not, not a reactor. So because we're not a reactor, we can't get into this university program that provides fuel to research reactors. Uh, but we have talked to, to, uh, to NNSA and they think that what we're doing is very useful for, for not only DOE NE, but also for DOE NNSA. There's a lot of scientific needs for better cross sections in, in, the, uh, in the security world too. Uh, so they think it's a good investment for them. We've talked to both Y12 and BWXT about manufacturing the fuel. It was kind of interesting because, you know, I, we first had a, a kind of a rod design where we thought we'd have fuel rods and, uh, you know, BWXT and, and Y12 make plates. They, they don't make rods. And I thought, well, rods is easy. And they said, it, well, it's kind of like if you go to, uh, you know, and, and the plates they make are have, have very high specifications you know, for, for high temperature, uh, just much higher specifications than we're going to need, uh, higher flux levels. Uh, but when we went to them and we said, you know, these rods would be so much easier. They said, it's like going to a Porsche plant and saying, can you make me a Volkswagen? It's easier for me to make you a Porsche than to make a Volkswagen. So, so moving to the plate of design with our AI techniques actually proved, uh, proved much easier. Great. Russia, do you want the last word on this one? Sure. I, I just say um, we plan on getting our fuel from the RI program. Um, it's something that's a relatively small quantity because we're a small uh, reactor. We have a, we're not expecting the need to refuel. We'll be working at small uh, power levels, one megawatt thermal maximum power. And so uh, we, don't, we don't foresee over the life of the core to need refueling or to uh, to really to, to worry about that. So we're very confident. We started our conversation before we committed to go down this path with DOE, ensuring that they would be willing to supply this. We got a letter of support from them. And so we're, we're confident that they'll be able to meet our fuel needs. Great. Well, with that, unfortunately, I think we find ourselves out of time. Uh, this was an absolutely outstanding conversation. I learned a ton. That's not a, that's not a high bar, but I, I'm sure that our audience learned a ton as well uh, about all of the really exciting projects you have going on all these. I'll just say one more time from Clear Path, thank you to all of you, uh, Drs. Huff, Hines, and Towell for uh, sharing this with us. Thank you to Clean Air Task Force. Thank you to Secretary Baron Wall for coming and uh, sharing her thoughts and presenting with us today. And thank you to the more than 100 folks who uh, came and uh, uh, signed into this to listen into everything that was going on here. Unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to get to everybody's question, uh, but we, we hit a lot of them. And again, the recording of this is going to be shared, as will the transcript from the chat to the extent that's helpful. And I think um, uh, you, you'll be able to know how to uh, reach the, the panelists here if you've got follow up questions um, as well. So thanks again to everybody and have a wonderful evening. Thanks. Thank you.